Today we're at a FAS funded meeting looking at parasites in sheep and the theme of the meeting is test before you, you treat. We have three, three vets talking today, one on roundworms, one on sheep scab and one on liver fluke. We're grateful to our hosts, uh, Robert Catlin and family for allowing us to use their farm for today's meeting. Today I've been talking about roundworm control, really focusing on sheep enterprise systems, um, looking at how roundworm control implicates fat lamb production as we see here at Hassendeen. In terms of faecal worm egg counting, uh, what we've discovered from the audience today is that there is a reliance on the anthelmintic products that are currently on the market. But there is also this consistent feeling that we as a group of farmers are not using them in a sustainable manner. And so therefore, we need to get better at understanding when to use these treatments. And the diagnostic tests that are available to us are fairly limited. There, is, there are crude things that we can do looking at the blood of the animal to help determine gut worm is potentially an issue. But essentially, diagnostics are going to be based on looking at the egg count within um, the faeces of that animal and using that as a guide with regards to whether we need to treat the group or individuals within the group. It's very good to have an understanding of that because we do get samples handed into the lab that are suboptimal for testing. So there's a couple of things we need to be aware of. We want fresh dung, um, so ideally we want it to be warm. Um, the reason for that is that if it has been hanging around too long, then the eggs that are within the dung will hatch out and therefore we will get a representation that's too low relative to the actual number of worm eggs that was there. So what we say is really we want samples that are fresh within a few hours, old before they're submitted to the lab. We want them ideally individual and we want them put in Ziploc bags if possible with the air expressed out because again, the development of the egg requires oxygen, so we want to expel the air from the bag. And we want them ideally individual, because commonly what we face is we get a sample that has been pulled on farm, but the consequence of that is there, is, there are uneven amounts of faeces from different animals put into a composite sample, so that when we do the average in the lab, it's gonna be a skewed average. So individual samples ideally, um, in individual bags with the air expelled and then we will pull them at the lab and fresh samples and if we can't get them directly fresh we would ask that they're stored in the fridge until the time they're taken to the laboratory. But I would take that a step further and I would be very keen for clients to actually go out with a relatively low capital cost, two, three hundred pounds for a decent enough microscope and actually start doing this uh, in-house because then in a time frame situation, we can get lambs in, we can collect dung, we can have a result within 15, 20 minutes, and then we can make that judgment call as to whether those lambs need treated or not before they're then returned to the pasture. In terms of then determining if a treatment has worked, it's very important to look up follow-up testing. And how we would do that is we would repeat a faecal worm egg count after those animals have been treated. And that's critical because anthelmintic resistance is obviously very prevalent to certain groups of wormers uh, in this part of Scotland. And so we need to determine if those treatments have been effective. We want at least a 95% reduction in the number of worm eggs from pre-treatment to post-treatment, but we're realistic that this doesn't happen all the time. And that information is absolutely central and critical to how we then advise those lambs or, or on that farm products to be used in the future. If we know there are high levels of anthelmintic resistance to certain products on this farm, for instance, we will take that information when reviewing the health plan and potentially not use those products in the future or use them at certain different times of year when we think the different worm species are perhaps more susceptible to that product. So the importance of quarantining incoming animals is very relevant at this time of year. 
We're recording this well through August. And so we are at the time um, when historically sheep will come on, whether it be ewe lambs, whether it be tups, whether it be replacement gimmers. So there's going to be perhaps quite a lot of movements onto farms of breeding stock just now. Um, bringing in anthelmintic resistant worms along with other parasitic challenges. Today my colleagues have talked about liver fluke and they've talked about sheep scab. But if we focus on worms and anthelmintic resistant worms in particular, um, if we do not quarantine effectively, we expose ourselves to populating our farm with anthelmintic resistant worms from somewhere else. Those anthelmintic resistant worms will remain on this farm and they will stay anthelmintic resistant worms. So the long-term implication of that is very significant. In terms of, I think, farmers are very good with the concept of quarantining. They understand botting animals should be isolated and separated on arrival. Where I think we are perhaps not as good and where we can improve is we need to then treat those animals with the requisite products to try and mitigate against these incurring risks. It's a complicated subject, perhaps beyond the remit of, of this discussion, um, but there is good advice to be had on the SCOPS, the Sustainable Control of Parasites and Sheep website. They've got a really good section on quarantine. And likewise, your own vet will tailor advice to this specific farm. But it's going to involve a combination of products. What is critical in addition to just using those products is then that these animals ideally should be yarded for a few days. That allows for the majority of the worm eggs within them to be expelled not onto the pasture, but onto a yard the faeces of which can then be taken away and destroyed, put in a midden or whatever, but not spread on pasture. And then once those two days have elapsed, we would advise that those animals go onto contaminated pasture. And what I mean by that is I mean pasture that has been grazed fairly recently by the current stock on the farm. And the idea of that is that they mix and become acclimatized to what is on the farm. Um, and also, if they still have any issues with regards to resistant worms, those worms are diluted within the parasitic challenge that is, is on the current farm. If I was to highlight three uh, top tips, if you like, um, to come out of what I've discussed with, with the farmers today. Um, the first tip is we appreciate that how we use these wormers is not necessarily the most sustainable fashion. And therefore, I would advise prior to doing any treatment, let's check and see, test before we treat. Let's see if this group needs treated. We're gonna do that with a fecal worm egg count. Top tip two, we wanna make sure that treatment's worked. We live in a world of developing and increasing anthelmintic resistance. And so we cannot now assume that any specific treatment has worked. So therefore, do a follow-up after treatment to make sure that the treatment has been effective. And my other main point to come out of today's discussions would be review your quarantine procedures at this time of year. Take advice from your local vet, and there's lots of good advice on the SCOPS website, and have a robust policy that you follow very closely for incoming stock. We've been having a meeting on farm today about fluke control on your farm and the strategies of when to test and then once we know what's there, how to go about treating. A lot of people ask us to put together a standard treatment plan for their farm. However, the disease that fluke is means that it's extremely weather dependent and farm dependent. Um, so it's, it's, it's not appropriate to put one plan together um, and we need to be looking at this each year um, for your farm, for your fields and with the weather in mind each year. Within your farm, um, the fluke uses an intermediate host called the mud snail. So without the mud snail, the fluke can't thrive on your farm. So we need to look at your farm to find out if we've got areas where the mud snail can thrive, um, and if so, where those habitats are, and if we can avoid grazing sheep by those habitats. We also need to look at the weather patterns to see when those snail habitats are thriving, because that's going to help us decide when your sheep are most likely to become infected and then it's going to guide our treatment plans. As regards 
testing for fluke, there's numerous different tests that we can use um, and each test is probably more relevant to certain times of the year and certain weather patterns. So I think we can't just broadly say just use this test at this time. I think it's something that you've got to have a conversation with your vet um, about your farm and the weather patterns that we've had to guide when to use those tests to their best effect. Another thing that we have to think about is when we bring new animals onto our farm and what disease they might be bringing with them and then what challenge they're likely to meet on the farm, um, on your farm when they come. Um, so there's absolutely a need to think about what those sheep might be carrying when they come on and whether we can test for that um, depending on the time of year and how to quarantine treat those animals to reduce the risk of bringing new disease onto your farm. When treating animals for fluke, um, it very much depends where those animals have been grazing. Um, so any animal that's been grazing at risk pastures will need treated because getting fluke is quite catastrophic for a sheep. Um, so it is important that we get rid of disease if it's present. So if you have areas on your farm where there is no snail habitat and the sheep that are grazing there aren't infected, there is no need to treat sheep that don't have fluke infection, um, but we need to assess those risks carefully. Every time we treat, ideally we'd like to follow up to check that our treatments have worked. Um, there are tests that we can use to follow up, they're not quite as easy as some of the other parasites that we look at, but they're definitely there and they're definitely something that we should be looking to do. I think if you had to take away three key points from today, it would be to know your farm and know where the snail habitats are on your farm. I think the second one would be that you need to make a different plan each year depending on the weather and that has to be done annually with your vet um, to look at the risks. And I think the third point which probably goes for most treatments, is that if you do need to treat, treat your animals well, make sure you know what they weigh, that your dosing equipment is working um, and that you know what product you're using. I was asked to come here today to talk a bit about sheep scab and the importance of test before you treat so that people know what they're dealing with on farm. Sheep scab is becoming an increasing problem in some ways we don't know the full scale because we know that the notifications that APHA received are not the, the full story, but there do appear to be increasing notifications and certainly feedback from farmers would suggest that the scale of the problem is increasing every year. There are a number of reasons why the number of cases seems to be increasing every year. Partly we do have problems now with ineffective treatments and um, scab mites have developed resistance to the injectable products so that was confirmed in 2018 and we know that is an increasing problem. We don't know if all cases are to do with treatment failures, um, sometimes it's the increasing movement of sheep between different areas and a lot of times sheep are not treated when movements happen so it's quite easy to have the mites being spread unseen. If any farmer has suspicion that he might have sheep scab so he's seeing potentially itchy sheep, one of the first things they should do is notify AP, APHA because it is a notified disease in Scotland. Um, his next thing to do is contact his vet so that tests can be done so we can find out whether they do have a sheep scab problem or whether it's one of the, the other causes of itchy sheep. So things like lice will cause sheep to be itchy or in wet years like this there's an infection called dermatophilus which can give sheep really itchy skin. We only really have two main treatment options for sheep scab. One is plunge dipping with OP sheep dips and the other one is injectable macrocytic lactones. So there's a number of different injectable products but they all fit into the, the one family. So it, it boils down to two different treatment options. People shouldn't be using OP dips through showers. Um, the products are not effective when used through a shower. The sheep must go through a plunge dipper and they should be in the dip for at least 60 seconds and be submerged two or three times while they're in there. When you're selecting for sheep scab, because you can't see which animals are infected, it's essential that every animal on the farm is treated so that you know you've got your problem under control.
The mites can survive off the host for up to 19 days. We don't think they're still reproductively viable after about 16 days, but the live mites have been found up to 19 days after sheep have mo been moved off pasture or out of a shed. So if you know that that field or that shed has been empty for at least 19 days, you know there won't be any viable mites still around. Um, when you're treating sheep for sheep scab, it's really important to move onto clean pasture as soon as treatment's happened. And it's also important not to mix treated sheep with untreated sheep, because after injectable products, it is possible for the mites to still be alive for up to about 12 days after treatment. So this definitely shouldn't be mixed with any untreated sheep. So there's two different ways you can diagnose sheep scab. One is using a microscope. So you take a skin scrape or a wool pluck and you look at it under the microscope and look for the, the mites being present. The other way you can do it is you can take blood samples from the sheep and look for antibodies to the allergens that the mites produce. So the sheep are allergic to the faeces that are passed by the mites and they produce antibodies to that. So my three take home messages are, make sure you don't buy sheep scab in. Any sheep that come onto your farm from other places, whether they've strayed, been away for wintering, or whether you've bought them in, you need to be very careful that you don't bring sheep scab with them. You can either treat on arrival to make sure that you're not gonna have a problem, or alternatively, you can hold them in isolation for about four weeks and then blood sample at the end of that time to check whether there's been any exposure to sheep scab. The second message would be, make sure you know which pro problem you actually have. If you have itchy sheep, make sure you know whether you are dealing with sheep scab or whether you've got lice or another problem, because not all treatment options cover all different problems. For example, the injectables don't treat lice, and equally, if you're using the poron treatment that should treat lice, then it's not going to be effective against sheep scab. So you do need to know what you're dealing with. And the third point is to make sure that if you are treating for sheep scab, to make sure your treatment has been fully effective. We do know that there's problems with resistance to the injectable products. So if you're in any doubt that your treatment has been infected, effective, go back to your vet and make sure that the problem has been solved. And if, it, if the original treatment has not been effective, you may need to go back and use an OP plunge dip to treat for sheep scab. Hi, I'm Tiffany Stevenson and I gave an update on funding which is available to look at some of these options in sheep. So there's funding through Preparing for Sustainable Farming, so there's nine different options available and you can pick two of them and for two of the options you can get £250 stand cost for each of the two options, so that's £500 and you could also get an additional £250 for your own personal development so you can spend time talking to your vet, doing some research to learn more about the health things on your farm as well. From the nine options which are available, there is funding available for looking at liver fluke. This is in both sheep and cattle. There's also funding available for looking at roundworms, again, both in sheep and cattle. Looking at sheep scab, and also looking at iceberg diseases as well in sheep. So the funding is available for any of these options which you've taken out between the 1st of January 2024 through until the 31st of December 2024. And claims have to be made before the end of February 2025. So there's still plenty of time, but you can get your claim in now if you've already done some of these options. There is an expert advisor form which needs to be filled in. So if you've had your vet doing your faecal egg counts, give them the form, they'll be able to fill it in and sign it and then it's very simple for you to upload it and submit it online uh, through the Preparing for Sustainable Farming portal as well. Well that's us finished for today. It's been a well attended meeting with uh, a lot of interest from uh, local farmers uh, and some good questions uh, to, to the vets, uh, our speakers. For more information about this meeting, uh, go to faz.scot.